Hey, 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 episode 231. This is Human Factors Cast. We're recording this live on January 13th, 2022. Uh, I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Mr. Barry Kirby. Hello. Hello. Hey, everyone. We got a great show for you all tonight. We're going to be talking about how virtual conferences might be more inclusive and eco-friendly. And later, we're going to be answering some questions from the community about useful electives to take in school to augment your Human Factors journey, how to network when most of those networking events are happening online now. And we'll talk about some of our favorite recommended exercises throughout the design process. But first, hey, uh, we have a Human Factors Digital Media Lab that you can participate in if that is something that you are interested in. Uh, we're really excited to have our 2022 kickoff meeting tomorrow. Uh, so it might be a little late if you're listening to this, but we're always looking for uh, energetic, passionate people to join our lab and maybe get their hands dirty with some human factors work or, you know, figuring out some interesting ways to communicate human factors. I always like to plug it because it is such a cool thing that we've started over here and I'm really proud of some of the stuff that's come out. But anyway, that's that's all we have for show notes or <laughs> community updates, the programming notes. That's what I'm looking for. That's all we have for those uh, this week. We know where you're here. Let's go ahead and get into. Yes, Human Factors News. This is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. We have a really interesting one this week that's kind of tangentially human factors related. Barry, what is the story this week? So this week we're talking about our virtual conferences are better for the environment and more inclusive. So the COVID-19 pandemic has brought uh, travel, work and in-person conferences to a halt. But new research finds this shift has made it easier for more people who could not previously attend these events to participate and lowered their environmental footprint. Researchers have analyzed several science conferences that went uh, virtual during the early months of the pandemic. In a new paper published in Nature Sustainability, the researchers examined the environmental, social, and economic costs of virtual conferences compared with in-person events and analyzed how the shift online altered participation by women, early career researchers, and scientists from underrepresented institutions and countries. The study found that virtual events lower costs and reduce time and travel commitments that have previously held some conferences back from attracting a diverse group of attendees. Also, the environmental costs of hundreds or thousands of people flying from around the world to attend a conference are eliminated. In addition to cost, in-person events are also required tremendous investments in time. These events often require uh, these events require travel, often last last multiple days, and take up all of the attendees' time while while they are there. The study found that many benefits to virtual conferences but the challenges do remain. Among them are a lack of engagement and missing out on in-person networking, and in-person conferences are beginning to return. But the researchers expect many events to create hybrid, off hybrid offerings, potentially at lower prices. So it seems that the, the idea of these conferences are potentially here to stay. What do you think of that then, Nick? Uh, in other no doubt news, um, it sounds like, you know, I, I think a lot of this is fairly self-evident uh, with... The benefits of some of these virtual conferences, yes, they're more eco-friendly when you look at everything. No one's traveling to these things, and you can put it on for a relatively uh, small carbon footprint when no one's taking planes and no one's having to stay in hotels that use energy, That all this stuff. I think it also makes sense from the other perspective where, you know, it, to be inclusive, for somebody to just stay at home... And, you know, that is your sort of lodging for that conference event. The The cost of admission might be lower because you don't have to reserve a space physically. It, it just seems very obvious to me. But I do think that this is a really cool springboard for talking about conferences just in general. And I know this is a human factors show, but there are human factors conferences and there's human factors chan tangential conferences that should follow this format. And it's a really interesting thing. You can actually do, uh, you can use human factors principles to make conferences better. And so this is a little bit of de departure from our typical human factors content, but still very relevant. Barry, what did you think of this story? Yeah, I think clearly the pandemic has provided a real, um, real point in time to think seriously about um, the advantages of doing stuff online. Um, they do say, you know, 
innovation is is the mother of, is born or, born from necessity. And if we didn't, if we weren't able to do these things online, then we just wouldn't have uh, we wouldn't have been able to have any conferences at all. Whereas as it happens, I think I've probably attended more conferences during the pandemic because I've been able to just dial into them, um, zoom into them, Teams into them, uh, or whatever software you care to, care to choose. Um, I've been able to jump into them, and I've been able to get to a lot more content. Um, and to be able to present to a much bright, uh, broader range of audiences. Um, I mean, this year we've already been to Australia. We're going to um, the States in a couple of weeks. We're doing, you know, so there's various bits and bobs. Um, and so, yeah, um, brilliant. And the ability for, um, you know, people from, multiple people from companies to go to these sort of things. You know, because normally if you've got, you've got one person going to a conference out, out, of a com- out of a particularly larger company, so maybe out of a department or something, because you can't afford to have two or three people out of the department. You can't afford the travel for two or three people. Um, and that's before you get into, I think, which, which is one of the mainstays of that um, article, which is actually a lot of the underrepresented people can go there. It's not just the the person who normally goes on the conference can can go to the conference or the heavyweight goes to the conference. It's the, uh, everybody can have that opportunity. But I do think, as it does, does raise as well, we the presenting and the information side of things is, is one half or probably two thirds of what a conference is about. The other bit is actually talking to people. is the is the coffee breaks? Is the going to go up to somebody and say, "I I just heard your um, talk. Could you come and tell me a little bit more about it, maybe?" Or I disagree with you, or I wholeheartedly, you know, that the whole interface bit is. Um, or somebody did to me one time. They they sort of called me, uh, suggested I was a bit stupid, um, but then I found out that was because they um, I I did I fundamentally disagreed with what they, what they were saying in 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 um in prose um but the um and i'm going to do that again soon as well um but yeah the idea that um you you've got to have that the the bit around the bit around the fringe that bit about you know going perhaps going into the bar in the evening or whatever to 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 chew stuff over and meet new friends um i still don't think we've got that thoroughly cracked on online yet so um i think a bit of, i think we'll probably talk about that that in a bit as well so um, yeah we will uh, I, I I often joke that the that we uh, we go out networking when we're and I, I do the air quotes for networking because it is it is drinking at night with yeah. your yeah. human factors buddies uh, and just talking about the stuff that either you're presenting on or catching up on life and that's really important and we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit um i I don't want to put the cart before the horse but I, I do think that is a really important aspect of it that I think. A lot of people know is important. Um, I'm sorry, I cut off your your opening thoughts. No, no, I think um, that that pretty much summed it up. I was going going to suggest that maybe do we want to talk about some of them? Them, you know, we you mentioned in your bit that the we there are human factors issues in organizing these in organizing a successful conference. So, what do you think some of them are? Yeah, let's talk about them. We have we have a long list here. Uh, maybe we just talk briefly about them. If we have anything to say, we can dig into them. But first and foremost is the organization of the conference itself, right? And I think if you think about before virtual only conferences or before hybrid uh, conferences, I think there's um, th- there's a distinct difference. I know some conferences will actually require that their leadership get together in a small gathering to plan out the conference. That now hap- has to happen digitally as well, right? There are uh, pre-arrangements to make. There's stuff that you do after a conference is kind of like a post-mortem. There's always backup plans that happen to contingency plans as well. And so there needs to be a lot of thought and effort put into the planning phase itself. And that usually results in a better conference. You know, the better prepared you are to go in, uh, then the better your conference is going to be. And so that planning phase is really important. We can talk about how that is impacted by being remote. Uh, I think it's fairly obvious there too. But did you want to talk about anything here? Or do you want to move on to the next one? No, I think that I think just to sort of reinforce that whole planning bit, and it's often the plans that you don't see that show you how good a conference is. So in obviously 2020 for the um, CIHF Ergonomics Conference, we I remember sat in a committee meeting, was it in February? January, February time, whatever, and, and they were uh, they, in the council meeting. They were saying, "Oh well, you know, there's this coronavirus," but we were still in a physical meeting. So it was like this coronavirus thing. We don't know quite what's going to happen. So maybe we need to think about going online and and stuff like that. And 
you could sort of find that feeling around the room of going, yeah, I guess we should do something like that, but it's not going to happen. It'll be fine, you know, but yeah, a bit of contingency is probably a good idea. Um, but it just shows that the effort that the that the team, actual organising team that went to, so when the pandemic hit and we were like, we need to go online, actually it was, oh, it felt, um, I know it wasn't because there was a lot of effort that went into it, but it felt it was turnkey. It felt like it was, it was a natural transition. And if you, that, level of planning that level of of um, back planning and um, contingency planning shows if you've got a really good team together that they can just turn this thing on and, and it just runs and, you, and it's almost seamless as if well what did you expect you know of course it's seamless um makes such a difference how much how much lead time did you have on that but between like lockdown and the event um look so the Ergens conference was in april so about a month Okay, uh, so not a lot, really. See, because I had something very similar happen to me where we were doing it wasn't a conference, but it was for a user event. And hmm. um, basically what happened was there were it, it was a large gathering of, I guess, 200 plus people that were all coming together. And we were still unsure the week before the event, whether or not things would go into lockdown. Things went into lockdown here in the States, I think, on that Thursday and the event was the following Monday. And so we had four days wow. to really prepare what that would look like in a virtual format. We're, it went off without a hitch, but that's because we planned. We started thinking like, oh, yeah, this might actually happen. And then we did. Yeah, great. Let's get into academic program. I think this is really important for a lot of conferences. Barry, you want to talk about this one? Yeah. So, I mean, when you uh, put putting together the academic program, and sometimes I do sort of bulk a bit about the academic bit of actually, because I think we should be transitioning to a broader range, which actually the online stuff lets you do more of, but you need to have a good range of presentations um, in, you know, that look at the entire focus of what, what the conference is about. So make sure you've got a broad range of stuff that will appear, that will appeal um, to different people's interests um, because you want to go and go with the main core of what's going on. But actually what happens if you want to branch out a bit, diversify um, and, you know, have your, have your thoughts tested um, or the breadth tested. So, don't be too scared about um, exploring some diff different bits about the uh, about the format, about trying new things, such as mini courses, which may run over a couple of days during the conference, or talking posters, or you know, let people come up with ideas about um, showing um, the content in in different ways. Um, encourage a variety of programming, so it isn't just um, a, a straight up presentation. It could be it could be different things in there, um, different delivery ways. Um, and the printed program should be attractive. It should be easy to use. It should be easy to digest. Take that information. Um, it's almost that souvenir of, of the conference. It's that takeaway that you can put on the shelf and and look back with fond with, with fondness and, uh, and good memories. Um, given the what we talked about the um, environmental aspects, it should be made available online. So you're gonna it can be it is digital rather than just uh, just a printed program, and you should. Be, make that available before the conference goes so people can dive into into the papers can dive into the content and have some thoughts before they um, before they see the presentation um and so allow them to know what presentation they might want to go and see um so there's a lot about that program that you can put together and um basically make it really really attractive but also make it really accessible um in ways that perhaps we haven't always done in the past yeah i think one big point that is starting to emerge here is making this frictionless for the conference goers. I think that is kind of the theme that we're seeing and we'll see it continue here. The next one that I want to jump into is venue. And this is something that largely was in control of physical locations, right? You could talk to a hotel and see what kind of accommodations they can make for your conference, how many rooms they have available. Now, the venue is digital. And we can talk about what digital venues look like. Uh, we've actually been to a couple conferences virtually that have interesting venues. We'll talk about those, but that's now one thing that you need to control for, but in a different way, because now everyone's in their own climate. They're, they're in their own environment. And so this area that I'm in is my conference area. It is also where I podcast. It is also where I work. Uh, and so it is different now. Um, you know, you, you no longer have to worry about things of whether or not you have good connectivity for Wi-Fi. Uh, you don't need to worry about whether or not 
um, people work online and need to take off a full day for the conference because they can just kind of dip in and out depending on their work schedules. Yeah. I think, I think this is a big one that is, uh, you don't have to worry about equipment. You don't have to worry about transportation to and from the venue. You know, it's, there's a lot of things that now are cut out. It's like, what, what digital platform do I use to host this event? It's, it's different. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really have much else to say on that. You want to get into the social program? Just one more thing on venue, actually, is when we talk, because we, we're going to talk about, um, or there's going to be come up quite a lot about this idea of a hybrid conference, about whether what we do online and um, and virtual. So that sort of goes along with venue. So how, yeah. um, and I don't think, I don't think I ever necessarily have, have an answer to this, but that hybrid nature has got to be something we really think about. And it's going to evolve, I think, over the next couple of years about what does good hybrid hybrid elements look like. Is it the same event at the same time? Is it a split event or or whatever? Um, That's a great point. Anyway, yeah. Um, so as we sort of alluded to earlier, the possibly the most important part of a good conference is the is the social program. Um, the when in the in the bad old days, the the only time that you want to go and actually talk to people was in the coffee break. Um, was in that bit, maybe at the start of the conference or just right at the end. But actually, you know, in in that intervening bit, when you when you're holding that cup of disgusting coffee um and and tepid tea um so but now we it's it seems to be so much so much different so actually coffee breaks themselves are an event you've got the uh, the stands to go and look around you've got the um you're going to go and pick up the your freebies your your gizits or your goodies um but we also have uh, the social, yeah the, you've got to have a pen you've got to have a lanyard tote bags are very popular nowadays you know, then, then it's a sort of well, you've got to have the tote bag to put everything else in. So whoever gets the tote bag out first, um, clearly is on a, is on a winner. Um, but you, a lot of the conferences we go to now also have have some element of social activity. So it can be um, everything from um, quiz night to um, the uh, we we I did what what the murder mystery. Um, which was which was really really bizarre, really interesting because I was all, also found out last minute I was one of the characters, um, but also um, you know, everything from comedy to poetry readings to going outside and looking at city walks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, it, the the conference itself is not just um, about the delivery of that information; it's about the opportunity to engage. And sometimes it might be the the one time in the year. Certainly, what I find um, because. If you're going to go out in, as, as consultants in um, in the ergonomics world, you might only be one or two of you in a large organisation, so it's not that often you get together as a as a cohort. And so it's that one time in the year that I, I think that there's a bunch of people who can get together and you can reminisce of what you've done over the past year and maybe what you did about five years ago and over a, over a glass of wine or a or a jar of ale that type of thing. Um, but I think that they're not the only things that help make it work. Do you want to talk a bit about, about the importance of conference staff? Yeah, so so the staff is going to be sort of key for whether or not something is successful. A lot of this, a lot of times, depends on volunteers being able to um, stand in and kind of guide some of these, I guess, discussion panels or anything. It, it basically depends on the people. And a lot of it is going to be who's working the registration counter and who's, you know, checking people in or who's making sure that you've only had one alcoholic beverage with your free ticket at the, you know, <laughs> so there's a lot of people and there's obviously hotel staff that can help with that, but I'm using hotel or conference, uh, conference staff that can help with that. But uh, a lot of it that really does depend on the people. And so I don't know how much this changes from a physical environment to a virtual environment, but the only thing I do see changing is the way we communicate. And so um, I can talk a little bit about that when we get to the conferences that we've attended and kind of the difference there. Yeah. But do you want to talk a little bit about the speakers that we sort of uh, bring in for some of these conferences? Because I think that's also another really important draw. It is. I mean, the um, the, the quality of the speaker is going to directly re directly rank your conference in terms of what you know how good your conference is going to be it's that it's the, it's the initial stuff that's going to draw people in um and and that is also reflected in a the um bringing out the, the that nature of um of who they are as the pre-advertising but when you're in there as well you listen to their presentation you listen to um, what they've got to say 
and they will more than likely be your lasting reflection. Um, and so there's probably for every conference I've been to, there's probably only one or two people that I'll that will stick in the back of the mind and and you'll bring out. Um, they um, they're the people that that have probably done a lot of work to get you to um, where you're at. But it's not just them. So you've got your maybe two three keynote speakers. You've got your two three uh, big guns, as it were. But you there will be so many more people there who are presenting um, who are. Just do, you know, I would say just doing the day job. It's not, you know, they're, they're actually, for some of them, it'll be their first time presenting. Um, it'll be, you know, so it, it's about us providing a, a good supportive um, community to allow them to come and tell us what they've got to say because they might not be that experienced at presenting stuff, but they wouldn't have been selected to come and tell us about it if you, if the stuff they, wasn't, they, weren't, they were going to tell us isn't good stuff. So um, whilst the big speakers are really important, so are the little guys like us. So um, we, we should cherish them all. I agree. So I'm going to I'm gonna kind of skip over the next two. I'm going to mention them briefly, and then I'll get into the next one. I, I only mention this because it doesn't really impact us directly, conference goers directly, I should say. So there's things like value for money, um, making sure that the people who are going are getting something for their money. I think that does impact us. But if you look at other things like sponsorships, um, that kind of helps offset those costs of having some of the um, some of those materials available to you. I'll also talk briefly about advertising. Advertising happens at conferences. This is people you see them kind of sitting in the exhibition hall, which is like another thing that we'll talk about here in a minute. But and and that changes dramatically for these types of events. You can plaster advertisements all over an event online, and it just becomes different. It. I don't see it as too different from a physical environment where you have an advertisement on, you know, maybe a, a banner um, on the program or anything like that. It's still kind of in your face. It's still there making its way into the unconscious. I am going to get into plenary sessions because you talked about the speakers. Um, yes, these these are kind of the um, the bread and butter, if you will, day job talks that are about the research that's actually being done. Maybe not these huge transformative names in the field, or it could be, but they're just presenting on some of the work that's coming out of their lab, at least in the human factors domain, right? There's sort of this um, this feeling of belonging to a group when you have a set of topics that a plenary session is kind of centered around, right? So like, my favorite, one of my favorite ones at HFES, which is actually really hard to do virtually, is um, my VR and me. I think it's called that or something. My my uh, my VR and me. I, I don't know. It's basically a, a a room where people give a five minute presentation about their VR and how it's helping whatever it is, and then you can go around the room and demo those things, and it's really cool. That's harder to do virtually, but you know, having having a topic of VR and demos that actually does uh, bring a bunch of people together and make them feel like a group, and that also helps promote the networking aspect of it. I've talked enough. Why don't you get into the exhibition room? Yeah, I mean, the the exhibition room is all about that bit where um, you know everybody can um, tr advertise their wares, be it from you know the books, uh, which is obviously the the popular one you. Um, anything that's that's lately published, and anybody who's got a got a, a desk there with freebies. I mean, this is where this is going to get harder in the um, in the virtual space. So we talked about advertising a bit earlier as well. I've sponsored um, conferences, both live and virtual. And one of the best things I like to sponsor is are the lanyards, for example, because lanyards everybody's got them. It presenters wear them, everything, and you get really really good exposure. It isn't quite the same on the online. So when we move to the online bit, and they're like, oh well, what? How could we translate that sponsorship into an online niche? So well, I'm not entirely sure, and I'm not convinced that as a value for money from a an employer, so, so as a sponsor perspective, we've necessarily found the right thing. I'm not saying what what they've done is bad has been bad, um, but I I don't know whether that same level of impact is there yet. And the same is almost for exhibition rooms. How do we get? How do we do the exhibition room in the in this virtual space? Um, but the it's it, we'll we'll sort of see how that evolves. But fundamentally, we need it is a really valuable part of the conference because it's a bit where you can just have a mooch around and and you know find that book that you can never find online uh, and things like that. So, um, how do you find that? Do you find conferences actually support speakers? 
I well, yes. I, I think being clear in communication, um, sort of making sure that they are aware of what the process is for submitting a paper, for uh, when they are going up, what the schedule looks like, all that stuff is really important. Uh, and I think this has actually changed with digital formats because now they can pre-record their their recording and just give them a video and they don't even necessarily have to be there, which is kind of really dramatic change from needing to be there in person. A lot of people will pre-record it, show up and answer questions, have the discussion afterwards, at least from my experience. I am going to skip over a couple of these. I'll mention them briefly. I think we talked about a lot of sort of the the key elements that make a conference successful. There's also considerations about the size of the conference, what to do when the conference is over, following up with participants or uh, conference goers. There's also kind of what is included in that conference package. Is it just a conference or are there workshops as well? And then last but not least, all this we've kind of been mentioning is in effort to make sure that the people who are going to these conferences feel like their experience is a good one. And sort of reducing friction at every point along the way will kind of lead to that. Now, I I do want to jump into kind of our experiences with conferences because we've gone to different conferences over the last two years that have happened virtually that we've been to in the past that have traditionally happened in person. Did you want to talk about any, uh, like, like pick maybe one conference that you can compare and contrast or two conferences? Yeah. yeah I mean, the, well, the obvious one for me is the, is the CIHF ergonomics conference, which they held online 2020, 2020 and 2021. Um, they were, um, you know, essentially the same um, same principles, but they ran it all all digitally, and you had the main presenter doing their thing, and you had a chat bar that you could actually go and chat in, um, and and you go and dive in, and they, they still ran some of the other bits there because they normally run their AGM um, at the conference as well, and actually having the AGM online made it well much more att better attended than any other AGM I think they've ever had, um, and it allowed them to do like. Uh, pre-voting and all this sort of stuff so that was all really good i think there is certainly a lot that they um that they took over the bit that they that didn't work quite so well in the first year because it, it didn't happen was we didn't get much of the social um element because actually they run a, a killer quiz um they, the the quiz is normally really good really well attended and obviously with that happening i felt like there was something you know there was a hole in there which then they, they did they sorted out the, the following year um this year is going to be quite interesting because they're doing both. They're running a, an online, at the, so it's all in April. So at the start of April, they're doing a, a two days online, and then they're doing a physical two days at the back end of April. So we'll see how that runs out. Um, but the one that we met at was the um, Neuroergonomics Conference. Yeah, let's um, tag team that one because that, that yeah. one was really interesting. That one was a, a, the virtual venue actually made a lot of things feel like a traditional conference, you know, they had, it was a virtual environment. We've, if you want to go check it out, check out our NEC uh, 21 coverage um, and maybe watch the videos because we did actually, th it's basically like eight bit sprites where you're navigating around this virtual environment, going to different conference sessions that were ultimately links to zoom links. But yeah. I mean, you know, it, it worked. It was kind of like you're occupying the space Ultimately, I think what happened is they just threw out a bunch of Zoom links and said, hey, if you're interested in this, go to this link. If you're interested in that, go to that link. And that worked because it wasn't a big conference. It was kind of small and intimate. But being able to navigate your avatar in a physical or in a virtual space was kind of interesting because you could hear other conversations going on. It was still like this weird, do I jump in and say something with this conversation? Am I just going to kind of sit over there in this corner until someone comes over and interacts with me? There were other sort of networking events that felt a little forced, uh, mm -hmm. especially when like, you know, there wasn't, I, I think as part of the tools that they were using, but overall, I think it was a really interesting take on that virtual conference. What did, what did you think of it? Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, you mentioned earlier about having the staff there to help you along the way. And that's, I think one of the things that I felt that was missing because it was, I spent a lot of time trying to work out what's going on. How is it? How am I meant to navigate this space? And I spent more time focusing on the the navigation of the space rather than enjoying the the the, the content. Um, but again, that was only because that was the first time I'd used it. So clearly that would be a um, an issue I wouldn't have the next time we went in. But you're right in terms of it, tr it tried to 
do a replication of the space, but it wasn't. I like the fact that he went to this eight bit approach because it it was almost like going to play Minecraft. It wasn't trying right. to do anything fancy because as soon as you go something super VR or something like that, you always get somebody. And and I'm looking at you, uh, Professor Bob Stone, who jumps into any of that sort of conversation and say, "Well, that's not good enough. That's not you know that's not quite right." Um, and so it just negated all of that by putting onto a very common playing field, which I thought was great. It was a it was a really different way of interacting. I don't know. I'd, I'd quite like to organize an event in that space again, um, something small, something intimate, to to really explore how that would work. But then part of me is, is also like just that, just the normal um, single, because um, the, the advantage that, that, sorry, that the advantage that setup give you was you can run multi-track events, um, right. which is cool. Whereas the CIHF one that I mentioned was very much single track because you've got one screen and you're making the most of that one screen space. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, one note on the help. I'm surprised you felt that way because I felt the opposite. I felt the the helpers were in these bright yellow avatar uniforms with these big top hats that you couldn't miss them. Uh, and they were standing around everywhere in various places. And so maybe it's just the you mm. needed some offline help to to without interacting with a person to navigate the space. But that's interesting. Possibly, yeah, yeah. Um, I could talk about HFES as well. HFES has been different from I didn't go to the hybrid version this year. Uh, but I, I know they have split that up into two separate things. I can talk about what it looks like from a virtual perspective. It looks like just a bunch of screens. It looks like you're in a, in a virtual lobby where you can kind of go, here's the exhibition hall, here's poster sessions, here's that. And so it, it is kind of still figuring out how to navigate in this virtual space. But I think a lot of the stuff that we talked about here represented there. I do want to bring up a couple of these article um, dis discussion talking points. Maybe let's pick like two or three that were, uh, or let, let's pick two each and then, yep. and then we'll kind of go through them. For me, um, you know, we talked about sustainability. I think one of the, the points here is that an in-person attendance uh, for scientists from Africa to several recent events uh, was on the average of 80% to 250% of their country's annual per, per person GDP with approximately 3% per capita GDP for U.S. participants. And so that any the inequity between uh, countries is going to be massive for being able to attend these virtual events because anyone could go to them as long as they have internet and uh, can, you know, pay the price of admission. So, I don't know, that was one point that stuck out to me. What sticks out to you? Um, I was blown away by the women's participation. So the women's participation in virtual conferences increased as much as 253% compared with previous in-person conferences. I mean, to, that's incredible. Um, so when looking at the academia attendance by students and postdoctoral scholars increased as much as 344%. I mean, that's just showing that it, it, doing the online stuff is really opening up the ability to attend this sort of stuff. And fundamentally, we sort of talked about, about it on uh, previous ones where we talked about the, the engagement of knowledge and sharing of knowledge and open access to knowledge. Um, the the fact that we're opening up um, conferences in this way is is great. Um, you know, it's, it is absolutely fantastic. So yeah, I think that's really good. Yeah, another point I'll make, and this is one that we've kind of had, um, we'd gone back and forth on throughout the throughout the points here, approximately 75% of attendees at one scientific conference and 96% at another conference said that they preferred in-person networking and that virtual sessions felt inauthentic and contrived. And that's kind of what I was getting at with the mm -hmm. NEC. I think there were events felt a little contrived to me. Um, however, it, we're trying and it's, it's still unknown how to best do that in a virtual space. And I think you know, at, over time, we might get better at it as people get more comfortable with having their faces shown on camera or, you know, I don't know. There's just some things that we still need to figure out. But that was one thing that stood out to me. And I know that's one thing that a lot of people are still missing is that physical interaction with other people. Um, yeah. Any other points that you want to make here about the yeah, article? I guess the, the last one from me is is the is the climate impact. Um, I mean, the scale of climate impact is is staggering. Um, the researchers estimated that just a single attendee of an in-person conference in 20, 2019, averaged over the conferences analyzed, had the same environmental footprint as 7,000 virtual conference attendees. So 
the, the the fact that you could on the same on that same climate impact you could attend seven thousand for the same uh, virtually as doing one in one in person uh, just shows that it's you know if, if you're going in especially if you're perhaps not you just want to go in for a moot you want to go in for a browse you, you're not maybe completely bought into what a, a specific element that you desperately desperately want to go and see but you just want an overview um or you just want to keep you know keep it on whilst you're working it's an absolutely brilliant way of of doing that um and keeping your climate impact down yeah, I can say definitively, I attended more conferences last year than I have in any other year. Um, <laughs> I've been going to conferences. All right. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up on the discussion. I just want to thank our patrons this week for selecting our topic. And huge thank you to our friends over at University of Texas at Austin for our news story this week. If you want to follow along, we do post the links to all the original articles on our weekly roundups on our blog. You can also join us on our Slack or Discord for more discussion on these stories and more. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back to see what's going on in the Human Factors community right after this. Human Factors Cast brings you the best in Human Factors news, interviews, conference coverage, and overall fun conversations into each and every episode we produce. But we can't do it without you. The Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running the show come from our listeners. Our patrons are our priority, and we want to ensure we're giving back to you for supporting us. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like access to our weekly Q&As with the hosts, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Minute, a Patreon-only weekly podcast where the hosts break down unique, obscure, and interesting Human Factors topics in just one minute. Patreon rewards are always evolving. So stop by patreon.com slash human factors cast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you. And remember, it depends. Yes, huge thank you as always to our patrons, especially want to thank our honorary human factors cast staff patrons like Michelle Tripp. Uh, I, I do want to bring up so treasurer says it's okay to talk about patreon this week so i just want to mention that we are two patrons away from being able to be fully self-sustainable here at a podcast uh, which is kind of cool um you know we do actually pay for this stuff out of pocket and uh the patreon stuff actually really helps with that you know we're doing this live on several different platforms that wouldn't be possible without our patrons we have a wonderful website again wouldn't be possible without them this actually goes to hosting the podcast itself on uh, you know, the service that we use SoundCloud. So there's a lot of things that that Patreon money goes to. Again, we're two away from being able to like, finally, wipe our hands clean and say, Okay, honey, I don't have to spend any more money on the podcast. Do it for my wife. Uh <laughs> <laughs> oh, that heavenly she'll day. <laughs> she'll, she'll thank you. All right. Yes. Uh, patrons like you keep the show running. Thank you all so much for your continued support. We're going to go ahead and get into this next part of the show. It came from That's right, it came from We're going to do a little something different this week We actually got one from Discord uh, This is part of the show where we search all over the internet To bring you topics that the Human Factors community is talking about So if you find any of these answers useful Give us a like or whatever it is Wherever you're watching To help other people find this content First up today, we have one from Tara Talon do you have any videos or helpful, useful electives to take in undergrad? So um, I actually answered this one in Discord, but I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, Barry. Yeah, I think there's... Um, basically, I think having that idea about what it is that you that you want to go um, to go and do um, all the way through is is kind of really helpful. Um because if you if you know that you're really super keen on on a specific thing, then anything you can do to block around that and support it. So look at the adjacent um, route, um, sort of saying you know if you're um, if you're into design, well you could do design elements. If you if you want to be doing if you're into sort of testing or uh, them type of things, then you could go and cluster around that. But then the the flip side is to actually um, you. It doesn't necessarily support it, but um, look at almost the opposites idea as well. Is do something completely different as well. Um, the beauty about the human factor side of things is there is nothing, or there is very little that won't come in useful at some point. 
Um, so if you want something just to be able to provide variety in your life, you can go and do something almost completely different because actually it will probably come back and back and be helpful and it will provide you some variety in the course that you're doing. Um, so <laughs> it kind of goes back to, it kind of, it depends. Um, depends what you want out of life. Um, I think, Personally, I think if you focus too much on just one thing, you might um, not burn yourself out, but sicken yourself um, in doing that. So trying to find different things to do that are that are tangentially, tangentially useful, but um, um, but are different, I think help uh, make a more interesting course that way. What about you, Nick? What, what what was your words of what was your words of wisdom? Yeah, great, great. Uh, so great feedback. I think I, I want to mention one thing too. Tara Talon is in the chat. So if there's any other clarifications, this is rare that we actually have an it came from where the person is in the chat with us. So if there's any other clarifications, let us know. So I mentioned that there are, in my head, there are three kind of ways in which you can tackle this, right? There's the fun route. The electives are, I think, meant to do that. They're encouraging you to go and look at hobbies or uh, augment your experience. I think you know, for me, I did like an archaeology class, which was something that was cool. And I actually learned a lot from that class. Mm. I, I I don't know if I use that stuff in my human factors training, but I'm glad I took it. It was fun. Uh, there's also, you know, like music classes that you can take that will help stimulate your brain in other ways. And this is what I traditionally call the fun hobby route, right? There's also the support route, which is kind of like a way to augment your experience with stuff that will help you in the long run, right? You said maybe a business class here or there, maybe a um, maybe an engineering class to figure out how people write requirements, maybe a design class to help understand how that process is done, maybe a software development class to understand kind of what's possible with code and what different languages do. All these are really good options uh, although you talked about burnout, that's a possibility here. But again, if you if you have interest in any of these things, you can almost double dip and say, yes, this is going to be fun and I'll learn something for it. Then there's what I, I almost don't recommend. It's kind of what I did in a lot of ways. It's kind of the fast track path. It's the quick and easy pick courses that have easy teachers that is you don't care about the content. You know, you can just kind of do the quizzes and skate by. Um, and the reason that this is an option is because it will help you focus on some of the other classes that might be tougher. So if you know you're going to have to take in your program a very tough class with a very tough professor that has the reputation of being tough, this might be an option to offset some of that work that you know you'll have in another class. So all I'm saying here is just be strategic about it. I do want to bring up Frank, uh, who's been on the show. He's actually in Discord, too, responding to this. Says, uh, Frank is recommending the full support route, especially if those classes can be rolled into a minor. So this is kind of augmenting that major with a minor. Frank argues that hobbies can be pursued at less costs than going to college. And, and I agree. I think there's plenty of resources available to folks that they can go and find uh, information for hobbies, but they don't have that one-on-one -on -one with a teacher, which I do think is really valuable for those. So I'm, I'm going to argue for uh, still looking into that approach. I think, um, you know, the, there's a, a communication class is another thing that I brought up that you can use to augment. We do a lot of communicating. Sitting here on a podcast, I'm communicating with you right now. I communicate with users. I communicate with stakeholders. There's a lot of things that you can learn from that class. Uh, dictation, speech and dictation. That is something that you can also learn. Uh, different languages. That's also communication, right? I, I know there's some language requirements in some of these things. I'm, I'm going on and on and on, but this is just to give anyone who else might be in this situation some ideas on how to look at this. So I don't know. That's that's kind of my thoughts. Do you have any other closing thoughts on this one before we move on? Yeah, I guess the two that I would almost really push um, is what well, you've already said, the communication side of things. So much about what we do in Human Factors is about bringing different groups of people together and being able to communicate with them. And, and including that is that public speaking element about being able to present. Not not everybody is um, confident in public speaking. Um, I mean, even now, um, I think we talked in the pre-show about um, 
imposter syndrome and things like that finding good techniques to get over them sort of issues is really really helpful the second one is project management um so learning a bit about project not an in-depth um course or anything like that but learning about particularly the two main styles of um, agile and um, waterfall project management is quite useful because you will come across quite a lot of that in different bits and just knowing the terminology will be will give you a significant jump start in your early career i would suggest yeah one one last note i did forget to mention that frank also said that a writing class could be helpful so i i do think that is uh, situational but i do do a lot of writing so i can stand by that all right let's get into this next one here this one is with most networking events happening online what are some of the best ways to network for those who are looking to begin a career in human factors or ux this is from brewmaster 21 on the user experience subreddit they go on to write i've personally found it rather difficult to network through online events what are some ways that a fairly new graduate like me can network with fellow designers Barry, do you have any advice for this person? Um, well, this really hits into what we were talking about earlier in the in the main topic. It's almost like we we, we thought it's about like, it. Yeah, it's almost like we prepared. Gary. Um, I don't know. It is quite difficult, isn't it? Because, I mean, we talked about the neuroeconomics conference and being able to just, I mean, that's one of the first places that me and you had a discussion, uh, for example. There. So you can go and do it. But it's almost, I almost find it no easier no harder but also no easier than a physical conference because i don't know about you but i sort of struggle um quite a lot if i if i'm in a crowded room i don't know anybody i'm not the best in the world at just going up to a random person and going hi i'm barry tell me about why you're interested or, you know that you know doing that whole just interacting with people just off the cuff i'm, I'm not very good at it i have to really steal myself up to go and do it so i think the first on doing it online, know your platform, know that you can, um, you know, how the, how it works. And, you know, it's, it's already been highlighted. I clearly missed a, a major part of the neuroeconomics bit about how to use it. So make sure you know, take that bit of time to, to learn the platform. Um, but also don't be afraid. Um, most people who, if you go up to them and virtually or physically and say, hi, I'm such and such, I'm interested in what you're saying, or I disagree, or, or whatever. Um, most people will go, because then most people are, are feeling probably very similar to what you are. Um, and yeah, just go go and make some friends, though I fully recognize how difficult that, that hard, how hard it is to do that. But um, nobody's going bite to bite your head off. Yeah, I, I echo that. It is, it is hard. Uh, I think one piece of advice I would have for you if you are looking to connect with other professionals online, there's conferences, but then there's also other things. You can join communities. So we're actually talking with you that you've posted in a community, you've posted in a subreddit. Maybe follow up with people on some comments from this thread that you've created. Join other communities. Hey, we have a Discord and a Slack that you can join and talk to us about. If you're listening to this and find it helpful and want to connect with other people, Sometimes it's quiet, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes we get great questions and great discussion in there. And that is another way that you can communicate with people. You have to put yourself out there. You have to ask questions. But, you know, I try to at least reach out to people who are um, in our community. So if you want to connect, let me know. We can, And, and you never know what you're going to find from those connections, too. I don't have to go and tell you the, the value of doing networking. I think you get that. But. You know, maybe if you're interested in something, I can put you in touch with somebody else. And you don't know that until you interact with a community. And so there are online communities that you can join. I would say, you know, Facebook groups, maybe there's something there, uh, Discord, Slack, Reddit, any social media. Go go check those out. I don't know. That's kind of my advice. Uh, any other thoughts? Yeah, I think just kind of echoing what you said, Liz, um, look at the different platforms. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing a, a starting to see a bit of a growth in, on things like TikTok and Snapchat and things like that. Um, if you see something on, on TikTok that you find amusing and stuff like that, obviously there is loads of, depending on, on how the algorithm, algorithm is working for you, you get to see a variety of things. Um, but I'm seeing a, my, my algorithm has, has sort of um, evolved, to, so I'm seeing a lot of space stuff at the moment. And just being able to drop a comment in there and say, oh, I'm really liking your work or whatever. Any On any platform, if you give some feedback, chances are 
the uh, the content creator will reach back out at you and and say hi, or somebody else in in the thread will say hi as well. So, yeah, just just bite the bullet and 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 just say hello. Um, um, but also go into I think going to groups and stuff that are around what we do. Sometimes I get convinced to go into um, the bre- bre- business breakfast networking events. And um, as soon as I walk into them, I wish I could walk out of them because um, it is the one where you're in a room full of everything. Most people have never even heard of human factors um, or or anything. And trying to sell that to some small business owner is incredibly difficult. And, yeah. and quite frankly, it's a waste of my time. And the breakfasts are normally that, are not normally that good anyway. So I'd avoid them. I can hear Blake in my head saying, Go to local things like there's meetups and there's local chapters of Human Factors and Ergonomic Society here in the States. There are local things that you can go to and network with them locally. Um, I'm just hearing him in my head. Uh, not not literally. It just he's there. Oh, that would be weird. <laughs> uh, and so so maybe do that. And of course, <laughs> he probably has a lot of a uh, lot of recommendations for that. OK, let's get into this last one here. Your favorite recommended exercises throughout the design process. I'm going to say this name. I swear to you, this is what it is. It's by Tifa's Titties on the <laughs> user experience subreddit. What was last week? We were talking about NASA relabeling their their sleeves. Uh, and now we're talking about. OK, so they go on to write. Hello and good afternoon. I have a question for all of you who have gone through the design process and would love some input. I'm currently in a boot, a boot camp student who has finished the first phase of my coursework. As I move ahead, I'll be working on some capstone capstone projects to build a portfolio um, while doing so, I want to push myself and expose myself to as many different tactics and methods in the design process. I have a fairly strong list of exercises to use as I work, but I wanted to hear from the professionals who have had hands-on experience and may be able to shed some insight. What are some of your favorite design recommendation, recommended exercises throughout the design process? Barry, what, what are some of your favorite exercises? Um, I don't know whether I've got particular favorites and it sounds such a, almost a, um, a sort of professionally thing to say is I use whatever's appropriate to the task. That's completely not right. I do have Good things answer. that I wrote. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, and, and quite right too. Um, but no, I think in the grand scheme of things, I do like, I mean, um, I like a good card sort, but I also love, um, I, I like a good focus group is my favorite thing. I like the ability to get all of your, because um, I'm a great a great believer in sort of the, the agile, the, the sort of the, the scrum approach in things. I like getting both software engineers or um, in the room and your end users in the room um, to break down ta- to break down your task analysis piece. Um, and I, the reason I love it so much is you can sit in there and you get, particularly if you've got, got your team well prepped, that you can turn around and say, um, right, how do you do such and such a job? And you'll get one user go coming in and saying, right, well, we do this, 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 this. And then if you've got, if you've set it up right, then somebody else turn around and say, oh, no, 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 that's not how we do it. We do it like this. And you first get the, you get that nice bit of discussion there. Then you get the software engineers chipping in and saying, oh, but don't you do this? Uh, because this is how we've, de- you know, this is how we believe that in our heads that this was going to happen. If you can generate that sort of discussion, then I feel like you've done your job and it's, and then you, you can sort of record that down. Um, and so that that's that's what that's the sort if we can set that up properly now it's the sort of thing that you can do really well in a room lots of post-its and all that sort of stuff that's fab but i'm still trying to get the same sort of appreciation online so we can run these sort of things online through um through teams etc but you still it's i still struggle to get the same spark moment um so we've been you know using various tools to, to try and make that work um but i do have a friend as well who's um she's really good at the whole card sorting piece and she's known as the queen of queen of card sort so whenever you need that sort of thing you always pull her in, in onto that project because um because that's that's very much her go-to which which i find fascinating what about you nick what, what's your what's your um what's your piece of choice yeah i have two that when paired together are extremely powerful but i'll, I'll talk about the first one because i forgot the name of it before the show i had to look it up it's a contextual it inquiry uh, a contextual inquiry is when you go out to the site of somebody who's using your product and you get what it actually looks like to use that thing in the context of their environment and their working environment. And so if you think about something like maybe, I don't know, 
an electrician going out to an electrical relay who's trying to operate on an electrical relay. They're trying to press all these buttons in a very cramped space. You need to know that. You need to know that they have gloves on their hands before they interact with the thing. So you can't make it a uh, you know a capacitive touchscreen. It has to be pressure sensitive touchscreen. You have to do all these things. I'm speaking from experience here. That's actually mm-hmm. something I've worked on in the past. Also with the defense industry, you know, you don't know that they're in this very quiet room uh, with this very locked down computer that they're working across two monitors. And oh, they need both monitors up at the same time. But yours is a web based application that you can't really spread across the two monitors. And sometimes they're different aspect ratios because they use what's available to them and things break. It's all this stuff that you get in these contextual inquiries. And when you pair those with things like usability tests, where you have them do those tasks in the environment in which they're operating, you can really get some great insight. So I'd say those two, contextual inquiry, usability test. All right, we have just a couple minutes left. We're going to get into this next section called One More Thing. Needs no introduction. Barry, Spark Notes One More Thing this week. What's your one more thing? So um, I've done something which I've never really, uh, which, I, which has been a, almost a life-changing moment for me this week. And that's how we've taken on a new employee at, um, in, in the business. And that's my daughter. Um, so my daughter's now uh, 17. She's looking to go to university and, and stuff. So, but she wanted um, a job to to make some money and all that sort of stuff. But also she's got, she's really into art and all that sort of stuff. So I was really keen to work out how we can, given that we do a lot of design work, A, could we, stretch what she does into doing more digital design because obviously that is a, a, a future um that's where the future is of art in many ways and also what what we do um but also it's quite nice i mean obviously we, we run the business me and my wife anyway so we do already have that idea of family working but it's just a, a it feels like a, a, almost a seminal moment where we've um um you know the, my daughter's old enough to employ and she's now joined what is now truly a family business. So that's been, um, that's been quite a moment. I, I, I printed out her ID card today and everything. It was, it was, a, it wow. was, it, it was a thing. Um, Big moment. Yeah. Um, so I think you, you said earlier that you've, that you've been part of a family business um, uh, with, with your, with your parents. So yeah, um, I think some of the advice you gave earlier, I think was, was, was very useful to, um, to sort of see it from that side. Just tell her don't mess up. <laughs> well family hopefully. businesses are always tricky that's <laughs> well, it's, it's multiple relationships isn't it it's yeah, um it really is we, different hats yeah i mean we employ um family but also close friends as well um which is possibly something you shouldn't you shouldn't do either but it's it's worked for 10 years now it, it, it's okay yeah. um but the my other thing is i'm trying to learn a new language um which for somebody of of my um aging years is i've never found languages easy anyway and so, but now we've moved to Wales and um, so we've been here four years Then I think I should make the effort. So I'm starting off, got one of these um, apps and I'm starting to learn the very basics or literally two days ago, started to learn the very basics of a new language and already I'm struggling, but, uh, but we'll get there. <laughs> You'll get there. Yeah. Uh, for me, last week I talked about mental health. Um, go, go get yourself some mental health. This week I'm going to talk about physical health. So I'm actually seeing a chiropractor uh, for the first time in my life. I got the whole x-ray thing and uh, my neck is supposed to be straight and it's actually, or it's supposed to be curved and it's actually straight. Uh, and so I'm going three times a week for the next couple months to get everything all straightened out and physical therapy. And yeah, that's my spine is fucked. So like, you know, it's, it's just, it's just bad. <laughs> Uh, but at the end of this year, you're going to be amazing. I hope so. Focusing on mental health and physical health. Yeah. 2020 yeah. is the year, right? All right. Well, that's going to be it for today, everyone. If you like this episode, enjoy some of the conference going conversation. We invite you to check out our most recent uh, HFES presidential town hall, where we actually talk to them about HFES and the conference itself. Comment wherever you're listening with what you think of the story this week. For more in-depth discussion, you can always join us on Slack or Discord. Uh, you can visit our official website, sign up for our newsletter, stay up to date with all the latest Human Factors news. If you like what you hear, you want to support the show, there's a couple things you can do. One, leave us a review wherever you're watching. That is free for you to do, and it really helps us out. Two, tell your friends about us. Uh, word of mouth is how we grow. And three, consider supporting us on Patreon. Like I said, we're two away from being self-sustainable. And as always, links to all of our socials and our website are in the description of this episode. I want to thank Mr. Barry Kirby for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about becoming a family member and getting hired by you? That might cause me a divorce. Um, but you can find me on Twitter at Baz underscore K. Or you can, my 
2022 program is about to start on the 1202 Human Facts Podcast, so you can find us at 1202podcast.com. You can always adopt. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me streaming on Twitch sometimes when I feel like it for mental health reasons and for <laughs> and across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it, it depends. depends.